Hey, well, welcome everybody to uh, Calvary Chapel South Pittsburgh Sunday morning service. We're so glad uh, that you've joined us uh, here this morning. And, uh, you know, I haven't been saying this. I uh, may have mentioned it last week, but uh, just uh, I, we encourage you just to make this as much like any other Sunday service as you can. So uh, that would mean getting out of bed. <laughs> Uh, getting a shower or a bath or whatever you do and uh, getting dressed and uh, just preparing your heart to worship the Lord and to receive from Him uh, because we're going to, over the next uh, several minutes here, we're going to lift up the name of the Lord in song and praise and we're going to uh, teach and receive the Word of God and uh, what a blessing uh, it is to be able to serve you all. And so, uh, uh, as we always say, the part that we can do as we listen to the word is to prepare our hearts to receive the word and then to obey it. So we encourage you, uh, when the worship comes on, to stand up if you can and uh, sing out to the Lord and uh, uh, just have an awesome time of worship while you're at home. Uh, several announcements uh, tonight. Uh, at 7 o'clock, we have on Zoom, Audience with the King, our corporate prayer. And afterwards, we have uh, Koinonia that will be going on, uh, I think, via Facebook Live. So uh, that's great. That's tonight. Monday night, we have a young lady study. And if you need info on that, you could contact us. Wednesdays is uh, our, uh, our midweek service. Those are our midweek services. We'll post that at 7 o'clock. And we're going to continue going through 2 Kings coupled with the book of Isaiah. And uh, uh, as we have been charged here as the leadership of the church to uh, uh, teach to you the whole counsel of God and not to resist doing that, uh, that's what we're aiming to do. And uh, what a blessing, uh, hopefully, that was for you. It was for me uh, last week. So that's Wednesday. Thursday, we have our youth group meetup and... Uh, I also forgot on Tuesday night we have our uh, ladies uh, Bible study via Zoom. So if you have any questions about any of those things, you can contact the church. Several of you have been sending me uh, encouraging emails about what you're doing uh, during the worship times, and those have been a blessing for me and for us. Uh, so keep those coming and keep in touch, and we're going to keep in touch with you and. Uh, we love you, and we're excited to worship today. So would you do me a favor and bow your heads, and we'll pray, and then our worship team's going to lead us in uh, worship. So pray with me, would you? Lord, we come here this morning. We're so thankful and grateful and humbled by your love and mercy and grace towards us. Lord, the truth is uh, we were sinners and had no way to get back to you, and yet you sent your son Jesus uh, to die in our place, to rise again. And now the Spirit of Christ lives in our hearts, and we want to sing about that. We're excited, and we celebrate that, Lord, and hear your word and receive it, and then go out and live it. So help us here, would you please, Lord? We need the grace to even concentrate, to think on you, to worship you. We pray and hope uh, that all of this today would be pleasing in your sight. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start with a couple of verses from 2 Corinthians 4, where it says, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. in my sorrows I'm trading my shame 
I believe I overcome by the power of His blood. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. song join the one that never ends because he lives I was dead in the grave I was covered in sin and shame Mercy, call my name. He rolled the stone away. Amen. Amen. I'm alive. I'm alive because He lives. Amen. Amen. Let my song. Take me 
and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he arose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. Conquer the grave, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. God is mighty to save. Amen. <clears throat> Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be 
your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Give and take away, give and take away, our heart will choose to say, Oh, blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, oh, blessed be your name, every blessing you pour out on the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, your glorious name, your glorious name. Lord, we thank you that your name is glorious. You are worthy of all our praise. We can bless you back just as you've blessed us, Lord, and we praise you that you are who you say you are. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. You are our all in all. We need you, Lord. We cry out to you. We pray. Draw near to us, Lord. Help us to draw near to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, uh, worship team. We appreciate you guys and gals. And uh, thank you for, um, you know, bringing us into the throne room with thanksgiving and praise, and we certainly appreciate it. Well, uh, today we find ourselves in the last book of James. Can you hardly believe it? Uh, this one's flown by, and uh, there's five chapters, and we're on the fifth chapter, and I think to myself, you know, James is often um, looked at as being very puzzling for some people because James talks about faith without works being dead. And oftentimes people who are first exploring the Bible uh, think to themselves, isn't that a contradiction between uh, what Paul said and, uh, and now what James said? Paul would say uh, uh, grace uh, is the way to uh, come back to God. Uh, it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Uh, it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Otherwise, uh, men would boast or people would boast. And yet, uh, I think as we keep traveling through the book of James, we see that this is a real and practical book written by uh, Jesus's brother that explores 
an unbelievably unlimited world of God's grace. Why do I say that? Well, last week we uh, found ourselves, didn't we, uh, uh, in the place where uh, we were talking about pride and how pride can uh, get in and is uh, very difficult and tough uh, for the believer or the unbeliever. And then we saw uh, that uh, uh, God gives us, in chapter 4, verse 6, he gives us more grace, not just grace to enter into the Christian life, but grace to live day by day, minute by minute, second by second, uh, the grace of God, or the life of a Christian by the grace of God. I, uh, we, we talked about this. We talked about how God's grace builds us up and uh, uh, has us be really strong and how our hearts are established by grace. And even grace that causes us to be thankful and grace to obey and grace to stand. And we talked about it, didn't we, that God resists the proud there uh, following in chapter or verse 6, uh, but uh, gives grace to the humble. And how do we access the grace of God? Through humility and faith. God gives more grace. And what James has worked so hard to do now over these last four chapters is to establish that men and women are to live a life in Christ completely dependent upon him, not dependent upon religion or status or anything else, but that they're to live in complete dependence upon the Lord. And so we get to uh, verse 1, and he continues on with this. Chapter 5 of the book of James, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten, eaten, excuse me. Your gold, verse 3, and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Do me a favor and bow your heads and pray with me as we dive in and finish out the book of James. Well, Lord, we do uh, come to you today with expectant hearts Settled hearts, Lord, we're uh, doing our part by uh, just putting away the things of the world and concentrating on what you'd have for us. And Lord, we know that by your spirit, you'll guide us into all truth. You convict us of sin and righteousness, show us righteousness. And so, Lord, uh, we ask that you would point us to the things that you'd want for each of us, the truth of the word. And then, Lord, you'd give us the ability to go out and live this world, or word in a dark and hurting world, an anxious world, a fearful world, Lord. We pray that your gospel would go forth and bring peace, reconciliation, and comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I've said, uh, some folks believe the book of James emphasizes works over grace. No, what we know from uh, having studied the book of uh, James is that uh, we come into the family of God by grace through faith. But a, a, a life that is truly saved, that is truly submitted to God, is not one that gets to God by works, but as he gets to God through the grace of God, it's a faith and a life that works. In other words, Works don't save anybody, and yet you're saved unto good works. Don't believe me? Well, believe the Bible. Just turn to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the most famous verses about grace and faith, but then continue on to verse 10 that talks about works that God has established for each of us and that we're to walk in. In other words, again, 
we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. And yet we're saved unto good works. And so we keep saying, right? Uh, James keeps telling us that we are to depend upon God for all things and all his grace. We ask that the, these things that we need for life and godliness come to us. It's the safest and best place to be. Turn with me at, before we begin over to the third chapter of the book of Philippians. The third chapter of the book of Philippians. Now, this is a different author. This author is Paul. In the book of James, obviously, we're studying the book of James, <laughs> written by James. But Paul says this, something that's really uh, fantastic. Uh, and you need to know the Greek word behind it, so I'm going to try and explain it to you if I can. He says this, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is, circle it, safe. The greatest and best place to be is to rejoice in the Lord. Let's break that down just for a minute. The word rejoice there is a verb, chairo, C-H-A-I-R-O, basically, in the Greek, which comes from the, substa uh, the substantive word, charis, charis, in other words, they're related. Chairo, rejoice, comes from charis, which is the word used for grace much of the time in the New Testament. So why am I bringing you here? Because Paul here is saying, as for the rest of the things that I'm going to write you, that's what he says in verse 1, chapter 3. That's the word finally. As for the rest, people of God, my brethren, listen to this. Rejoice in the Lord. We can joy in the Lord over and over and over again, regardless of circumstances. Paul here was in prison. And he was writing to this church that was not very wealthy or anything like that, that was established on a second missionary journey. He's writing to them as he rejoices. He's asking them to rejoice in the Lord. But catch what it means. The word that he's using for rejoice is the same word for grace, or comes from the word for grace. You get it? In other words, for those who found and discovered, or a better way is that maybe that God has sent them the grace, or grace, and they've recognized that they need to be dependent on Him. All's from Him. Salvation and ability to live this life they, we, are able to rejoice. Karos, a derivative of ka charis, the word for grace. Are you catching this? Are you catching this? In other words, Paul says, I'm going to keep reminding you of these things, and it never gets boring or tedious. Why? Because uh, these things for you are the safest and best places to live. Covered by the blood of Christ because of the grace of God sending his son, Jesus. Isn't that magnificent? Now we come, I've taken you to Philippians 3 in James, and now I'm flipping back to James chapter 5 because it seems as if he talks about something here that has nothing to do with grace, and yet it has everything to do with James's thought. Remember, James is developing the grace of God now here in chapter 4, which is complete dependence upon all that God has done for us. His grace. Get it? And he's worried about people. He's warning people. And this thing that he warns them about are riches. He uses this word, come now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Now look, we've talked about this on several occasions if you've been traveling with us. It's not a sin to have wealth or money. 
There's several people in the Old Testament and the New Testament who had wealth and money. But check this out as you read what Jesus says in Matthew 19, uh, 19, 23 and 24. Uh, Recognizing it's not a sin necessarily to have wealth. Catch this though. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 19, verse 23, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. By the way, in verse 25 of that chapter, his disciples heard it and they were astonished and said, isn't this interesting that they said this? Who then can be saved? Because back then, many people, just like today, many people, think if you have possessions or wealth, you must be the most pious and religious. And the disciples thought that, but Jesus said, no, 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 think about it. It's very difficult for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven because why? First Timothy 6 tells us. Let me read it to you. Starting at verse 6, 1 Timothy 6. Why, why is it hard? Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Going on to verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire, listen to this, folks. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, for the love of money, not money, by the way, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What is it about riches? Well, if you read this again, 1 through verse 6, he's not necessarily talking about somebody who just has wealth, but he's talking about those who are selfishly rich or and deceptively rich or fraudulently rich or use their rich, rich, uh, riches to oppress people. Look at it again. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your miseries, he says, would come upon you. Because, and, and, and listen, your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You see... Uh, those riches that are referred to there in chapter 2 can be, might be, a reference to crops and grains, which were something that were very valuable back then. Also, garments were very valuable. Isn't that interesting? Of course, gold and silver are valuable, but some say that they can't even corrode. So why does he say it? Because he's making a point that when you are selfishly rich and you're laying up treasures on earth, your riches are going to fade away. They're never going to last. They're uncertain, it tells us in 1, Corinth, or 1 Timothy 6, 17. They're wood, hay, and stubble. Your riches are corrupted. Your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion, listen to this, will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. When we're selfishly rich... When we're selfishly rich, there's so many temptations and snares that we can fall into where we can go from being a steward with our money that would be godly to being ones who carefully possess and hold on to and strategize and make wealth an idol. And when that happens, look, something happens to our character. Our character will do things we wouldn't formally do because of money. We'll say things we wouldn't elsewise say because of money and gain and more possessions. Well, he goes on and he says, look, you've heaped up treasure in the last days. 
Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, or uh, the Lord of hosts. That doesn't mean Sabbath. That means the Lord of hosts. That means the one who commands the armies. That's the one who comes in judgment. You understand? What do we know? We know this too. In Matthew 6, verse 24, Jesus told us no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what does he say earlier? This is the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. He says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where the thieves do not break in and steal. And here's a really important point, really important. I tell you all the time, I get this wrong and backwards all the time. I always think it says, for where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. It doesn't say that. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so the point here, I think what he's making is, is what are you treasuring? What are we treasuring? Now, we can say, you know, uh, uh, if we happen to be wealthy, we can say, well, yeah, you know, I give some money to the church and I go to the church. But remember, Jesus talked about not living in luxury. His disciples wouldn't even have places to lay their head. Am I saying you need to sell your house and move out? No. But do we really need the seven-car garage or the five-car garage or any of those things or all the TVs or those sorts of things? And remember that what Jesus thought was giving was when the widow gave hardly any amount of money at all, and yet it was sacrificial. And Jesus loved and marveled at that kind of giving, that sacrificial giving. So let's go back to verse 4. We're uh, uh, living then as people of grace, dependent totally upon God. We're to live not in luxury uh, or selfish luxury, but here's also something we are not to be doing. We're not to uh, be uh, fraudulently keeping back stuff or money or wages or gaining from anyone who we, um, uh, you know, maybe hire or have uh, work for us. Look at this. Indeed, the wages of laborers, verse 4, who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the uh, reapers have reached the ears of the Lord, of the hosts. In other words, if you search the Old Testament, there are several passages, several, that talk about if you're uh, hiring somebody to do work, make sure you pay them immediately. Don't even hold the money until the next day. Pay them. Don't hold back the wages. You're taking advantage, advantage of somebody who needs the money. No, you're not to keep anything back by fraud and manipulate the numbers. The cries of these reapers will reach out to the Lord of hosts. He pays attention to this. He will judge those who have treated people unfairly in money deals and in business deals. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as it's a day of slaughter. You understand how awful it is to uh, cheat and oppress people in the financial world, the Lord looks down upon it. And he says that people who do this are not living in dependence upon him by the grace of God. No, they've gone out and have lived according to the ways of the world. Remember, we'll talk about this several times through today. Uh, in Ephesians 2, we're told that the enemies of our soul as a Christian are the world and the world system of thinking, the flesh, that inner, um, uh, uh, you know, man that uh, uh, we're saved from and we're uh, to put to death and we're to put on Christ and put away the sins of the flesh. We're to uh, uh, crucify the flesh, that uh, part of us, the world and the flesh, and then the enemy of our souls also, the third one, the devil. And here... See, 
All of these things can come into play and take somebody who's a brother or sister in Christ and make them drift, get them off what God is saying to us. um, uh, Grace-driven people, grace-living people are ones who are great stewards with their finances. They're great stewards with their finances. They live according to what God says. Uh, We live for our needs. We have some needs. We take care of those needs and we're responsible and we need money to eat and we do those sorts of things. But luxury and all of those things that are wasted and thrown away, no, they could be used better for God's kingdom. And in fact, if you're fraudulently gaining money, through bad business deals or some other things, uh, these are looked uh, down upon and frowned upon by the Lord. And he has strong things to say about this. Look at verse 5. We'll say it again. You lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You've fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You're slaughtering these people and those sorts of things. You have condemned. You have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, several commentators puzzle over that The last comment there in verse 6, some believe this is a reference to Christ. You've condemned, you have murdered the just because of the sins that you've committed. You and I, we are responsible for putting the just one up on the cross. And he doesn't resist. He went to the cross willingly. Some people uh, believe that's what that's talking about. Other people believe this is uh, 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 man's kind of nature or instinct Toward, uh, to hate a ma- another man who's following the dictates of God. That sort of thing. You, you've condemned, you, you've murdered those people who have uh, followed the Lord. You, you don't want them uh, around. And so uh, be- even when he resists you, it irritates you even more. And some people believe uh, that's what that's talking about. Other people believe uh, this scripture here in uh, uh, this l- verse 6 is a reference to the courts. That the rich people even can uh, um, control the courts and the court system and have the, you know, the perks with the judges and the lawyers, etc. And you've condemned, you've murdered the just, and he doesn't even resist you or can't even resist you when you have it set like that. Well, what is he saying here? Uh, he's saying here that there's several now in the church and outside of the church who can get off track in the church and live this way. And yet the grace of God calls us not to live this way. And then there's people in the world who aren't even Christians, who've never submitted their life uh, to Christ, and they live like this. And what James is telling you here is that there's judgment coming. There's judgment. If you're a Christian, you'll be judged. Yeah, not for your salvation. We've talked about this several times. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, I believe it is. You're going to be judged on all that God has given you as a good steward. Did you use it wisely? Did you redeem the time? All your motives will be judged. You're going to not be judged for your salvation or for your eternal life. No, that's by the blood of Christ, but you'll be judged based on how you live this life. And that's why it's important to redeem the time and not to waste the time, right? But also, non-believing people will be judged. They'll be judged at the great white throne judgment. They're going to be judged on their own righteousness, not the righteousness of Christ, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation. They're going to be judged on their works. And if they've failed, if, if uh, uh, they've failed in any way, any point of the law, they've failed in all of it. If they've fallen short of the glory of God, their own righteousness, God who's fair and just will judge them because they wanted to be judged based on their own righteousness. So what he's saying here in this letter is you don't have to worry yourself about all this and beat yourself up and uh, be fixated on it. In fact, uh, Psalm 73 addresses it. Psalm 73, the psalmist is so uh, uh, honest there. He's talking about, how come, Lord, why, Lord, Do I look out at the wicked and they prosper, and yet sometimes I don't prosper? Why, Lord? It's bothering me. And he goes on for several verses. And then later in the psalm, he says, but then I came into the sanctuary. (laughs) And for lack of a better phrase, Lord, you solved it for me. I saw you, and you solved it for me. In other words, you were saying, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that. Of course, we're to stand up for 
uh, the oppressed. No one's saying that. But have you ever thought, why them, not me? Psalm 73 addresses it. Here, James addresses it. Well, he goes on. He says here, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Get it? We're grace-based people who are living by grace day by day. We walk around and we see others who are benefiting and living in luxury, who are cheating and prospering. And sometimes it bothers us, Lord. And here he says, just like Psalm 73, be patient. Hupomone in the Greek. Be patient. Stay under. Stay with it. Persist. Keep waiting on me. Keep working. Don't, don't give up. Persevere. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Be so patient, he says. I will, he, he goes, I want you to look how the farmer waits for the precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. What's that talking about? Well, in Israel, in late October or early November... They looked forward to the first rains, the early rains. What, would they, what, would those, what were those rains for? It was to prepare the soil, to cultivate the soil. And then guess what they would do? They would sow. They would sow the seed. They would plant. And then they would keep working, keep tending to their crops, keep tending to everything, keep working at it, keep doing the stuff that needed to be done just as a farmer needs. Uh, and then they were praying and hoping that in late April or May that more rains would come, these latter rains which would grow and bring to blo uh, harvest and bloom and bring it up out of the ground in great and bountiful ways. They need both rains. They need the early rains and the latter rains, and you know, what does a farmer do? They depend upon the Lord for the rain. They do their work by sowing, and they keep, you know, keeping the animals out and tending to the weeds and doing all the things that farmers do, and they're expectant that a harvest is going to come in due time, but guess what? They need another rain from the Lord. And so they learn, what do they learn? They learn to patiently trust the Lord. That's what a farmer does. He learns to patiently, or she learns to patiently trust the Lord. And here he says, be patient here, folks, until the coming of the Lord. The church, the early church, James here, the leader of the early church, do you see how important the coming of the Lord and the doctrine of the coming of the Lord was to the early church, and it's still to be important several places in the New Testament. He talks about the coming of the Lord and how we're to live in light of the coming of the Lord. And there's several things that we're to be doing, waiting and watching, but how do we wait? Expectantly, looking up, knowing that he could come at any time. And we, we have to be patient. There are some things that the Lord is going to take care of when he comes back. That's what he's saying right here. So don't get so worked up about it. Don't get so anxious about it. Be patient, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. See how that farmer waits for them. Look, look at this. This is not a mistake or just a coincidence. He doesn't just look for the fruit. The farmer looks for the precious fruit. What, what are you and I called to be doing here? I say it almost every sermon. You and I are called to be ones who bear fruit, John 17, that glorify the Father. We do that because Jesus Christ came and died for us we sur and, and then rose again and we surrendered our life uh, on the finished work of Christ at the cross. Our sins have been nailed to the cross where they are held against us no more. We come back into a relationship with God the Father and now the Bible tells the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ comes to live in our hearts and we are to be ones just like the early church who are going out and telling others the good news, who are to love others, who are to meet the needs of others, but then tell them the good news, the gospel. And then as the Lord brings them 
uh, into a new relationship or to new life with him through the gospel, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, then we're to disciple those and to build them up. And then what are we to do? We're to send them out. And the people who God brings into the kingdom, look at this, including you yourself, look at this, you're not just fruit, you're precious fruit. See, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So I understand, the writer says, there's people who are getting rich. They're wealthy. By the way, side note, rabbit trail. If you live in the West and you're listening to this, you're rich. If you've been to third world country or other places, um, uh, you know, around the world, poverty is oh, just stark and it'll hit you in the face. And for most people in the Western hemisphere here, the United States, we're rich. We have homes and we have cars and we eat three times a day. So we need to be careful on how do we define uh, and complain to the Lord about what we have and don't have because he has supplied our needs. Well, anyway, back to the text. Be patient. The Lord's coming. And until that happens, the Lord says, I'm bringing about precious fruit. And you're going to have to be patient, setting your mind on things above, not of the things of the world. There are things that are happening. Rain is happening. Planting is happening. Raining is happening. And at the end of it, there's going to be a harvest full of precious fruit people. So you go on. You also be patient. Of course, you be patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, this is beautiful. We talked about this last week. I referred to it when I was opening up here. Uh, the, uh, the summary of last week's teaching. Remember, in Hebrews 13, a book we uh, just recently concluded, the Bible tells us that our hearts are established by grace. Our hearts are established by grace. Our hearts are established by grace. And so here he calls us and he says, establish your hearts. In other words, cooperate with the Lord in his grace so that you'll be established, solid, firm, not fearing the day, that coming of the Lord, which is at hand. You're not fearing that. The reason you don't fear it, the reason we don't fear it, the we, reason we don't uh, fear the coming of the Lord when he comes back to the earth, the reason we don't fear it is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We're found in him, Philippians 3 tells us. We're in Christ and he's in us. And so now the Lord God, the Father, sees us through that lens, the lens of the, the blood of the Son. We're righteous positionally. And so we don't have to fear the coming of the Lord. What does the coming of the Lord mean? Well, we talked about this on Wednesday, just in a nutshell. The coming of the Lord uh, is uh, the program that the Lord has set up at the end of days or the latter days in which he's going to come in the clouds, 1 Thessalonians, and pull out his church in the rapture. He's going to come for us. And then as the church is out of here, there's going to be a period of seven years called the Great Tribulation. See, now Jesus came the first time to, in, in mercy and grace. He's coming in second time to be a judge. And during the uh, tribulation, while we're in heaven with him, uh, God's going to pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. And um, uh, deal uh, with his plan for the Jewish nation. At the end of that seven-year period, Jesus Christ is going to come back to the earth, his second coming, with his saints to rule and reign in judgment as a king. And guess what? For those who are found in Christ, you can be patient with all of this, and you can have your hearts be established be established, be solid. You don't have to shake about it. It doesn't have to be shaky for you. You don't have to fear because of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
The coming of the Lord is not something that the Christian fears. And yet, we are to live in light of the coming of the Lord, not wasting our days. Pursuing holiness and Christ-likeness, the Bible tells us. And on and on and on. He says something else. He says something else. As he goes on to verse 9, it's kind of a logical argument. Don't grumble against one another, brothers. See, what happens is, is when we see other people prospering and we're not, we're apt to grumble and to complain against one another. Why does she have that car and I don't have that car? I've been serving at the church way more than she has. How does she get that car? That's something that non-grace-based people say. Grace-based people don't grumble because you know what they say? Whatever I do here in the church or wherever is unto you, Lord. It's my worship unto you. And we root for other people. When we see others getting a bonus or a job or a promotion, yay, fantastic. We don't look out for our own interests, but for the interests of others. We're happy for others. That's grace-based people. So he says, look, don't grumble against one another, brethren. This is kind of, I have one in my car right now, maybe two. The engine light that comes on for the Christian. You, you get this? You, you, what do you do with the engine light? You ignore it like I do, or most of us do. And you think to yourself, my goodness, that thing, you know, computer diagnostics, they just want me to come in there. And so we ignore and we ignore and we ignore and then all of a sudden, the car stops or whatever, it clonks out, right? And you have to take it into the shop. See, grumbling against one another is, the, is one of several warning lights for the Christian. If you find that you're grumbling against one another, you're not living according to the Spirit. You're walking according to the flesh. You're living on performance-based Christianity and not grace-based Christianity. You're not looking at one uh, who got rich and says, oh, that's great for you. You're looking at one who got rich and said, why not me? Don't grumble against one another, he says in verse 9, lest you be condemned. Lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. By the way, uh, uh, Jesus is, uh, re refers to this uh, two times or a couple times in the New Testament that when the Lord comes back, it'll be like he's standing at the door, right? There's this judge that is standing at the door. Again, he introduced the, uh, the uh, doctrine that the, when the Lord comes back, he'll be a judge. See, I think that is a comforting doctrine. Most people don't. What do I mean by that? If God is judge, there's purpose to life. If there is no judge, there's no purpose. God's coming back as judge. All the wrongs that have been done are going to be set right. All of the injustices that were done uh, that you complain about and lament over on the news when you see them, he's going to set all of those right. The judge is coming. We live a certain way, knowing that the judge is coming. My brethren, verse 10, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering patience, as an example of suffering patience. If you uh, took a look uh, at the book of Jeremiah, certainly, he uh, was suffering. He was putting stocks some, and uh, uh, he was to uh, keep on going, and he didn't see much fruit from his ministry. And yet, uh, God doesn't measure our success in the Christian life by whether there's success, as I just said. No, he measures uh, uh, the success in the, uh, the Christian life by how faithful we are. That's what he tells us in the New Testament. Were you faithful? Were you faithful in the things that God gave you to do? He takes care of the outcomes. He's just asking you to be faithful in the things um, he's asking you to do. And here he says, we're to be patient until the Lord comes back as we 
win, build, and send people as we glorify God through our fruit until he comes back. And as we watch for him to come back, be patient. Don't grumble. And especially don't grumble against God. Be patient. There might even be times in which you think nothing is happening, like Jeremiah. He's called you to do something. Clean the toilets at the church. Set up the chairs at the church. Uh, do this, do that. And you wonder, is any of this any of you making a difference? And you cry out to God and say, why does the pastor pick him and not me or her and not me? And yet maybe the Lord's calling you to clean the toilets or to put up the chairs. Who knows? We're all a body striving and rowing in the same direction. He says here, be patient in all of this. You're important and you're part of the body. You're important. But remember, you can, uh, when, when you remember when you tend to forget, I'm saying it that way on purpose, to look back to the prophets as examples of how to be patient. Jeremiah was certainly one of them. Indeed, we count them, verse 11 tells us, blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of, of Job, uh, and seen the end intended by the Lord. You've seen the perseverance of Job, Job excuse me, and um, uh, you've seen the intended end by the Lord. And here's the intended end. Look at this. That the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. I'm going to take you back to Philippians 3 again. Turn there with me. You're, you're going to want to watch this or look at this. Go back to Philippians 3. And you're talking about a writer here who is the most well-trained, religious, Jewish uh, Pharisee. That was a sect of Jews that were set apart, who uh, laboriously and expertly studied the law and then debated and uh, decided and uh, fastidiously followed the law and told, it, told people what the law meant. They were the pious, religious people of the day. And one day, as Paul's walking on the road to Damascus, the Lord appears to him and asks him why he's persecuting him, the Lord. Why, Paul, are you, per he was Saul at the time, persecuting me? And Paul gave his life to the Lord, and later he admitted that he was a killer of the Christians. He actually had people pulled out of their house and killed. He was there when Stephen died, remember? And he did it all because these Christians, by Christ, through Christ, who followed Christ, these Christians were upsetting his religious apple cart. And he had this experience on the road to Damascus, and making a long story longer, he became the greatest church planter of all time. And that's most of the New Testament is written by this Paul. And Paul said this in Philippians chapter 2. I want you to see something. After he says uh, what I read you earlier in verse 1, he talks about how he is, of all the people in the world, one of the uh, supreme uh, uh, legalists who then were sa was saved by grace and has come into the family of God. In other words, all his material things, his earthly things, he wasn't laying up treasures uh, 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 on earth anymore. He was laying up treasures in heaven. All his earthly things were swept out from underneath him. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. He, but he was more concerned with the kingdom of God and God's gospel going forth. It was everything to him because he knew the Lord in a personal and intimate way. Read this, verse 7, chapter 3. But what things were gained to me? All my prestige, power, access, image, education, money, wealth, all of those things, I count, or I have counted loss for Christ. It's as if in chapter 7, he's writing this 30 years after the experience in Damascus. He's saying, it's if, as if in chapter 7, he said, when I first counted the cost, I counted everything loss for Christ, and yet today as he's writing Philippians, 30, 20, 30 years later, he says, yet indeed, I keep, I also keep counting all those things lost. What for? What is it that he wants? Is it to build all the churches? Is that his primary motivating factor? Is it to uh, build a great 
uh, uh, you know, wealth in the church or bank accounts in the church or to have people say how wonderful Paul was. He says, no, I count everything lost. I've given it all up for this excellence. Knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Just, just, just knowing him. In John 17, it says that this is eternal life, that we know God and Jesus Christ. Just knowing him, the beauty of God, uh, the beauty of Christ and what he accomplished. I read it to you at the beginning. We can rejoice in the Lord because of the grace of God sending the Son to die for us. And this is so beautiful. On the night in which he was betrayed, the one who was going to die for our sins got down on his knees and washed the feet. He served the stinky feet of his disciples. What submission. He got to the garden and he's bleeding uh, drops of blood. His disciples can't even stay away awake guards are coming and he says to the lord any other way lord for the father that this cup could pass from me but hey lord not my will but yours be done see this is the one we know the one who submitted to the will of the father who came and lived as a man and submitted to the will of the father even to the point of death so that you and i could have a relationship with god see It was the excellence of knowing Christ, the Savior. Now go back to James 5. Why am I going off on that rabbit trail that I hope is not a rabbit trail? Uh, Because this. He's given us these examples of patience, the prophets who would speak and sometimes see no fruit in their ministry, and yet the Lord said, patience, patience, My word doesn't come back void. Just patience. You're doing what's faithful. And then, of course, there's this one Job, the one, the book that all of us shy away from. No, we don't shy away from it. The one in which Job has all of these wealth and material things and this beautiful family, and it's all taken away from him in the first part of the book. And his wife even comes to him and says, just, this is so awful, Job. Just, just curse God and, and die. It'd be better. And Job doesn't. And then for the next several chapters of Job, he deals with these three friends that have this terrible theology. Just like lots of our friends when we're going through difficult times or tribulations. And they're saying things like, man, you must have some terrible stuff in your life to be handling suffering like this. And, they, and, and, and Job uh, 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 comes back at them and basically just tells them, even though in some parts, of course, like any man, he would, he would doubt uh, to the Lord, but he would never curse the Lord and never did his flame of faith burn out. And he would tell his friends, you're wrong. It's not just necessarily because, uh, uh, you know, uh, something bad's going on in my life. No, 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 no. God must be doing something else. God must be doing something else. What was he doing? Look what God was doing. He was bringing him through these tough times, through these very difficult times, into a place like Paul, where Paul could say, the only thing that matters to me is the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ. Here he's saying, oh, I've brought you through all of these things. I brought you through all of these things so that you could feel and know my mercy and compassion in a greater and bigger way. Wow. God works together for the good, for our good, to those who love the Lord and walk according to his spirit and purposes, doesn't he? But guess what will happen along the way right here? What will happen along the way? You know, remember I told you there's enemies of our soul, the world. What would the world say to Job? (laughs) The world would say, are you kidding me? You serve a God in which you go through tribulations? The world says, no. Get everything that's coming to you now. Leave that God and just go for it. Go for the gusto. What would the flesh say? The flesh would say, yeah, man, I don't want any suffering. And oh my goodness, what will the enemy of your soul do? You know what he'll say? He'll say, why are you staying patient with God? Become impatient with God. 
if, does God really love you? You ever heard that fiery dart? Does God really even love you? You're going through these tribulations, and yet we opened up this book. This book, this whole book started with the tribulations and what uh, uh, we are to do when we find ourselves in there. We're to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. Patience has its perfect work that we may be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing. And if we need wisdom in the middle of trials, ask and he'll give to us liberally and without reproach. There's lessons in trials. And one of the great things when we come out the other side as we resist the fiery darts of the enemy is to know the Lord in a deeper and more meaningful way. You catching that? That's what grace-based people do. That's how grace-based people live. In the middle of it, they don't grumble and say, how come that person's not going through a trial? And I am. What are you doing to me, Lord? Although we are normal sometimes and we discuss it with him like Job did. We don't curse him and we don't uh, leave him. No, we come out the other side dependent upon him, knowing him in a greater and more meaningful way. Going on to verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth. Now think about it. Why would he put this in here? <laughs> because if we're going through trials, it's when we often say stuff we didn't don't mean, right? But above all, my brethren, verse 12, don't swear either by heaven or by earth or with any uh, other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Now, I gotta tell you something. I've not done a very good job for you over the last several weeks. That should sound familiar to you because I, I referred to this maybe in the first sermon on James, but I haven't been keeping up with it and I should have. Whoever wrote this, and it was James, the Sermon on the Mount did a number on them or him. Why do I say that? Well, I count 18 times in this little book in which the author of the book, James, goes back to a part of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's, here's one of them. You see it right here. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't make irrational, rash, quick dim-witted uh, uh, oaths to the Lord. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. When you say you're going to do something, do it. When you say you're not going to do something, don't do it. And uh, just, just have plain speech. Well, this was referred to in Matthew 5 on the Sermon on the Mount. You could go. You could see it. 33 through 37. Very quickly, just jot these down. In James 1, count it all joy, I just read it to you. That's direct reference, I think, to Matthew 5, 10 through 12. When you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, to rejoice and be glad. How about this? In James 1, 4, it says, Let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete. I just read it to you again. That's a reference to Matthew 5, 48. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What about in James 1, 5 and 17? If you lack wisdom, I read it to you. Every good uh, and perfect gift is from above. Well, in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, knock, it'll be open to you. If your son asks for bread, you know that scripture. How about this one? Uh, James 1, 20, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Matthew 5, 22, on the Sermon on the Mount. But I say to you that everyone who's angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother, whoever says you're a fool, you know that, will be liable to the hell of fire. James 1.22. Be doers, not just hearers of the word. That matches up with Matthew 7, 24 and 27. Here are a couple others. God has a heart for the poor in the kingdom. That's James 2, verse 5, and Matthew 5, 3 and 5. There's the necessity of righteousness. In James uh, 2, verse 10, and Matthew 5, 20. Mercy to the merciful, James 2, 13, Matthew 5, 7. Recognize them by their fruits, James 3, 12, Matthew 7, 16. Blessed are the pe peacemakers, James 3, 18. Can you hardly believe it? Matthew 5, 9. Uh, ask and receive again, James 4, 2 and 3, Matthew 7, 7 and 8. You can't serve God and be friends with the world, Matthew, or excuse me, James 4, 4, Matthew 6, 24. Blessed are the mourners, 
James 4 and Matthew 5, verse 4, or James 4, 9 and 10. Be slow to judge, James 4, 11 and 12, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. It just goes on and on. God's provision for tomorrow, uh, James 4, Matthew 6, 34. Don't lay up treasures in heaven. I read it to you. James 5, 2 and 5, Matthew 6, 19. And on and on it goes. Whoever wrote this, James, was the Lord did something in his heart with that Sermon on the Mount. Oh, by the way, as we've studied that, hasn't it? The Sermon on the Mount. So what an effect it's had here. And here he says, just, just say yes or no and mean it. Have plain speech. Don't be so complex. And you get in the middle of the trial. Don't grumble and complain. And don't swear falsely. Well, he goes on. Grace-based people who live in the church, what are we to do? Well, look at this. Some of us are going to suffer. We're going to suffer. The Bible says there will be tribulation. Jesus says there will be tribulation in this world. Is anyone among you suffering? What should they do? They should pray. You say, well, that's pastor speak. Of course they're going to pray. Not really. When some people suffer, you know what oftentimes they do? They get the phone, they text 75 people and get their in, uh, input. Of course, you need to uh, uh, talk to other people, of course. But is the first instinct to pray? No, oftentimes not no. <laughs> we don't. Pray, pray. When we're suffering, pray. Hey, other times people in the church are going through a different season and they're cheerful. What should we be do? We should sing. Be a singing church. Singing psalms because uh, they're so fantastic in their beauty and their excellence. Let, let him sing psalms if you're cheerful. And if somebody's sick, what should they do? Let him or her, look at this, look at this. You talk about humility, folks. It's not the job of the pastor or the leaders of the church to be looking out amongst the local body and saying, who's sick and who can I go and pray for? It says, let the person who's sick call for the elders of the church. Of course, leaders and pastors here would be happy to come and pray with you, with other people. Uh, but did you notice it says, let him call? That's a sign of humility. I need help. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I need help. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Let them pray over him. Of course, they would anoint him with oil. Oil generally speaks of in the, uh, uh, the Bible of the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And yet, uh, there were some medicinal purposes. Am I saying there's oil here with medicinal purposes? No, I'm not saying that. I have some oil that somebody brought me back from Jerusalem. But no offense to the person who brought me back to Jerusalem, I could use cooking oil, olive oil, any kind of oil. I'm glad that they brought me some from back from Jerusalem, but it's not magic. The reason is, is because we're being obedient to what the Lord is asking us to do. It's not the magic of the oil. It's the one who we pray to. We pray in the name of the Lord. It's not our faith that heals them. It's the Lord uh, that, is, uh, that heals people. And it says here that the prayer of faith will save the sick. You say, well, man, I want to know what the prayer of faith is. Good. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. I want you to see it. If anything might be, could be, this prayer of faith, this could be it. Verse 14 of chapter 5, 1 John. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. Notice that we pray with total confidence in our faith. No, not in our faith. Not faith in faith. It's faith in the one him who can and who is able, that if we ask anything, if we ask anything, we get what we want, right? No, it's not that. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we asked of him. 
We pray uh, according to his will. We want to pray according to his will. So you ask me here, and the prayer of the faith or of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Listen to this. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Somehow, some way, this is closely tied to the forgiveness of sins because he says here in verse 16, confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another. There is some indication in the scriptures. Psalm 32, 1 Corinthians 11:30. that sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, don't say all the time, Sometimes, because of disobedience or because of sun sin, we might be sick. But remember, too, before you get all freaked out about that, we live in a fallen world where there's going to be sickness. Sometimes we're sick because we're sick in a fallen world. But here he says, bring out oil. As you call the leaders of the church, you who are sick, Call for the leaders of the church, uh, the pastors, the leaders, the spiritually mature, and have them pray over you, anointing you with oil. Do it in the name of the Lord, and the prayers of faith will save the sick, and of the Lord, and the Lord will raise him up. Well, in one respect, I know, and so do you, that that's a hundred percent absolutely true, because the Bible says for those in Christ. We're going to live with him in eternity for he- in heaven with a glorified, resurrected body that will never wear out. And there's going to be no pain, no tears, no sickness, no death. So in that respect, of course this is true. But what about why we live here on earth? Is it, it's God's will to um, uh, heal me from my sickness? And the answer to that is, I don't know. Of course, we believe that the Lord hears our prayers. We read it. And of course, we know that the Lord can heal just at any time. But we also know in the book of Corinthians that the one that we were talking about earlier, this one who had set up all these churches, Paul, he prayed after he had gone up into the third heaven and seen things that were unimaginable. He comes down. It's so funny in a way. Of course, it's so human nature. Wow, God showed me all that. I must be all that as well. So here's what I'm going to do, Paul said. I'm going to pray that he would remove this thorn in my flesh. And he prayed, and he wasn't healed. So guess what he did? He prayed again. And he wasn't healed. And so guess what he did? He prayed a third time and guess what happened? He wasn't healed. And the Lord told him, Paul, I want you to get to the place where you recognize here while you're here and always, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm not one to pretend to look into the heart and mind of God and understand why some people get healed and some don't. I don't know. But when we pray, we pray with expectancy to the one who can heal and by his will and ask him to do his mighty work and heal and touch people. And then we say, Lord, your will be done. And as we do it, we have confidence that These people are going to be uh, treated by the Lord for the best and for the good. Oh, and we love him for that. And then look at this. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Verse 16, now confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Of course, we're to confess our trespasses to one another and pray for one another. We ask the Lord for forgiveness, but guess what? Sometimes it's good and healing and cathartic to confess our sins one to another. Now that's a whole other sermon for another day. We can, who should we confess our sins to other than the Lord? When we say, Lord, I did this and it was wrong. Who should we confess our sins to? We should confess our sins to anyone that it's impacted and no more. 
And of course, those who are trusted friends that we uh, trust to, to keep these things uh, uh, in prayer and for our good. You understand that? So we're to confess our trespasses one to another. But, you know, if we committed a sin against one person and we go to that person like the Lord tells us to, we don't need to get on Facebook and spread it all throughout the world. We just need to go and make it right with that person as it's impacted. Does that make sense? I hope it does. But we're to confess our trespasses to one another and to pray for one another that you may be healed. And of course, we're doing that, and we talked about that. We will pray, and we pray that prayer of faith and leave it in the hands of the Lord. Well, know this, that as we pray, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, who do we ask to pray? We ask brothers and sisters in the Lord to pray, the ones who have been declared righteous. We uh, uh, have a fervent prayer of a righteous man, one who's been declared not guilty by the Lord, that's what that means, avails much. Have other people pray for us. And then he adds this in. He says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. Now that's shocking to a Jewish person, but it should be, as you've been studying the book of Kings, shocking to you. Because Elijah was a very important prophet in the Old Testament. You can look in 1 Kings 17 and 1 Kings 18. And he did battle against the wicked king Ahab and his wife Jezebel. And one of the things Lord told him to do was to go and tell him that there would be a drought. It would take now we know from the uh, full counsel of the word, around three or three and a half years. And at the end of that, uh, 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 Elijah was to pray and to pray and to be persistent. And then it rained. So there was a drought for three and a half years. And you say to yourself, the Jews would say to themselves, we say when we read, oh my goodness, he's a fantastic prophet. And yet the Bible says that he was a man like us. We're righteous too. We have right standing with God. We're to be praying for people. And he prayed again and the heavy heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. What we can do when we pray. What do grace-based people do uh, in the church? Well, they get together and pray. They ask for pray. They humble themselves. We cheerfully pray. We sing songs and we cry out to the Lord in joy. Those who are rejoicing sing psalms. And then we get to the last one. <laughs> what is the last thing that James leaves us with? It almost seems like it's, um, uh, you know, uh, slanted towards, okay, now here's the last thing I want to write you. It's church discipline. Yeah, maybe. It's grace-based living. Here's what he says in verse 19. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, if they drift away, it's possible, folks and someone turns him back. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And cover a multitude of sins. And that's the end of the book. You say to yourself, why is that there? Why is that there? See, grace-based people have the heart of Christ Jesus was one in that famous parable, the one I used to read as a kid and scratch my head, and maybe you scratch your head. He would leave the 99 <laughs> to go get the one. God loves people. The Son, God the Father loves people. God the Son loves people. God the Holy Spirit loves people. Our God loves people. And there are people who wander from the truth. They drift. They don't cultivate their spiritual life. And before they know it, they're gone and walked away. And one of the highest and greatest privileges that the Lord can use us in is to help people come back into the fold of God. You see it? In fact, in Galatians or chapter 6, they address it there. Paul addresses it there. 
Brethren, if a man is overtaken, verse 1, Galatians 6, in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of boldness, firmness, legalist, legalism. No, no, he doesn't say that. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And then he adds this, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. What are we to do when people walk away from the truth? Are we to get impatient and talk about them? Verse 9, no. As we cultivate and walk uh, the, the heart of God and walk according to the spirit of God, one who walk away, we don't point the fingers and gossip at. No, we pray for them. What's the highest and greatest thing we could do? Pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them of sin and righteousness. And then as we examine ourselves so that we could wipe away any log that's in our uh, own eye before we go and try to take the sawdust out of the one who walked away's life. We do it circumspectly. We go and gently but firmly, gently, gently but firmly, gently though. We bring and we bear with and we ask the Lord to bring them back into the fold. And I believe James ends on this note so that you could see what grace-based people do. They don't ostracize people, although there is a place for church discipline. No, they bear with people and their doubts and their struggles and they uh, help to bring them back into the fold. (laughs) So as we close here on the book of James, we see here uh, this very practical book, this very practical book that gives us what life is going to be like in the church of Christ, the bride of Christ. And here at the end, he warns us about our riches. And he tells us to be patient and perseverance. And then he goes on and talks about what will happen if somebody's suffering. What do we do? What if somebody has a cheerful part of life? What if somebody uh, is sick? What do we do? He gives us very practical advice. He says, what about the one who tries to leave the fold? Oh, it's there where I believe we see the very heart of God. It's one of our highest privileges to bear with people and to help bring them back. Amen. Pray with me. Well, Lord, thank you so much for this great day and for your word that's very instructive. And Lord, just is sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray, Lord, that uh, if there's anyone out there who uh, uh, is struggling in any of these areas, Lord, We just pray that uh, you would show it to us, um, whether it be here with me first or out in the uh, technology land. Lord, that uh, uh, you would uh, show us what it is that we need to turn from and agree with you that it's sin and then ask you to fill us with your spirit and walk according to grace where we know, Lord, is the safest and best place to be, where you, when you come back, would find us rejoicing, living by your grace. Thank you now, Lord, and always for your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you. and Have a great week.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is born. Thank you, uh, church. We're so glad you could uh, uh, join us. And um, uh, as we try to tell you every week, uh, God loves you, and uh, so do we. And if there's anything we can do for you, uh, please contact us. Otherwise, have a blessed week. God bless you.